Good afternoon and welcome to today's GW Law event, Ethics and Integrity Under Fire. My name is Jessica Tiltman and I'm the Assistant Dean for Government Procurement Law here at GW Law School. I am delighted uh, to, to welcome you to our great event um, that is co-hosted um, not only by my wonderful and incredible colleague, um, Associate Dean Lisa Skink, who's the Dean of our Cybersecurity, National Security, and Foreign Relations Law Program, but this program today is also co-hosted by the National Security, Cybersecurity, and Foreign Relations Law Program, the Government Procurement Law Program, the National Security Law Association, and the Anti-Corruption and Compliance Association here at GW Law. In 2019, the world first learned about a whistleblower complaint alleging that then Donald President Donald Trump had abused the office of the president by soliciting foreign electoral interference in the 2020 U.S. presidential election. The complaint triggered a formal investigation, which ultimately led to the first impeachment trial of Donald Trump. The high-profile investigation led by then Inspector General for the U.S. Intelligence Community, Michael Atkinson, placed an international spotlight on the whistleblower protections afforded to employees of the intelligence community, the critical role of Inspectors General, and the challenges of navigating a high-profile investigation in the midst of a political firestorm. Today, in a conversation moderated by GW Law Professorial Lecturer in Law, Katie Kedian, we will discuss these issues and more with Michael. Michael, who is also going to be teaching artificial intelligence in the fall at GW Law School as well. Now to introduce today's host and moderator. Professor Kedian has been a professorial lecturer in law with the GW Law School since 2018. She teaches counterintelligence law and policy and the disinformation and national security reading group and has also taught a seminar on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. She served for 13 years with the U.S. Department of Justice Counterintelligence and Export Control Section, former, formerly the Counter Espionage Section, holding the roles of Section Chief, Principal Deputy Chief, Deputy Special Counsel, Senior Trial Attorney, and Trial Attorney. During her time at G D D DOJ, she managed numerous successful high-profile criminal matters in the areas of espionage, leaks and mishandling of classified information, export control and sanctions, and national security-related cybercrimes. Professor Kedian has also previously served as Senior Counsel at Raytheon Technologies, Counselor and Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and she also clerked for the Honorable David M. Ebel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Now, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to my very wonderful uh, host for today, Katie Kedian. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction, and thank you, of course, to GW Law's National Security, Cybersecurity, and Foreign Relations Law Program, the Government Procurement Law Program, the National Security Law Association, and um, the Corruption and Compliance Association for sponsoring this event today. I am really happy to be moderating this discussion with my former DOJ colleague, Michael Atkinson. Um, before we get started, I wanna just give a, a brief introduction of Michael. Uh, as, as Jessica mentioned, Michael is currently a partner at Kroll and Mooring, Mooring where he um, co-leads the national security practice and is a member of the White Collar Regulatory Enforcement and Investigation Groups. He started his career as an associate and then partner at another uh, global law firm in DC. And then in 2002, he caught the public service bug and he left private practice for what would become really a stellar career of government service. First, as an attorney in the fraud section of the Department of Justice, where he was one of the first federal prosecutors to obtain jury trial convictions under the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Then he moved over to what's affectionately called triple nickel as an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia. And while he was there at Triple Nickel, he spent time as the deputy chief and the acting chief of the fraud and public corruption section. He then left the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. to return to, dare I say, the greener pastures of Maine justice, um, where he spent two, I shouldn't say that because I do think there are some former AUSAs uh, on, the, on this webinar, uh, but he came back to Maine justice where he spent two years in the National Security Division of DOJ, which is where I had the pleasure of working with him for a brief period of time. Um, at NSD, he was acting Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and he was also then a senior counsel to the AAG. 
Then in May of 2018, this is where we get to kind of the crux of what brings us here today. Michael became the presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed intelligence community inspector general, otherwise known as the ICIG, the watchdog responsible for overseeing programs and intelligence activities of what was then 17 departments and agencies in the US intelligence community. Now it's 18 with the addition of the US Space Command. Michael was in the ICIG position for a total of two years. During that time, as Jessica mentioned, events unfolded that landed him in a very public spotlight and ultimately to being publicly fired from his position as ICIG by then President Trump. Today, while there are a lot of things in Michael's public service career that would make for a really great discussion, we're focusing on his time as ICIG, what it was like generally, and then some key highlights from those very public incidents in 2019, the whistleblower complaint that landed on Michael's desk and ultimately led to the first impeachment of former President Trump. Uh, today, as we're going through the discussion, um, please put your any questions that you have, put them in the Q&A. You could also put them in the chat if, if you're more comfortable with that. So everybody who's on, please feel free to go ahead and, and put questions in, and then we will get to them uh, towards the end of our discussion. So Michael, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us for this discussion today. Thank you, Katie, for that very uh, kind introduction, and thank you to uh, Jessica and to Jean, uh, Dean Skank and to the GW Law School for the invitation to speak here today. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, uh, happy to answer any questions. So I was a, a big fan of a speak up culture at the, as an inspector general, and I'm still a fan of a speak up culture. So if you do have questions, please, please ask away. Great. Great. Um, so hear that everybody, please put your questions in, in the chat as we go along or in the Q and A. All right, Michael, um, before we get into the incidents of 2019, why don't we just, you know, start with a very high level. Tell us what exactly is the intelligence community inspector general and what role does it play in the US government? So the Intelligence Community Inspector General or the ICIG is one of over 70 inspectors general uh, in the federal government. And half of those inspectors general like me were presidency appointed and Senate confirmed. The other half are designated by their agency head. And what IGs do is they serve as independent watchdogs over the programs and activities that they are responsible for for their individual agencies. And they're responsible for basically trying to root out uh, detect and prevent waste, fraud, and abuse in those government programs. Now, what attracted me to the Intelligence Community Inspector General position was the really the breadth of the portfolio and the importance of the portfolio. As you mentioned, Katie, you know we work together at the National Security Division, um, and I really found the National Security Mission just really compelling and really important, and a way to have really you know profound impact. Um, a positive impact on our country. And I thought that the Intelligence Community Inspector General, which I really hadn't heard about until I got a call from the White House asking me if I was interested in being an IG, just sounded you know, like a remarkable job. And it turned out to be, in fact, a truly remarkable job because I had jurisdiction. My jurisdiction as the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community was coextensive with that of the Director of National Intelligence. And the Director of National Intelligence has jurisdiction over all of the intelligence community programs and activities across the enterprise. Now, obviously, the CIA has a director, the NSA has a director. Um, likewise, the CIA has an inspector general, the NSA has an inspector general. But I could look at any of those programs or activities um, now in coordination with the IGs over those specific uh, agencies and departments. But that was, that was my job, was to, uh, was to you know, lead that team, my office, um, uh, the Office of the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, to oversee those programs and activities. So we had auditors, we had inspectors, we had investigators, we had our own um, independent uh, in-house lawyers um, to serve, to give us, you know, to give the office independent legal advice, independent from the Director of National Intelligence, who of course had his own legal staff as well. And, uh, and we also had what we're gonna talk about, a very significant whistleblower program. And so those were the tools that we had to oversee, you know, to try to fulfill this, this huge mandate of trying to keep up with all of the uh, programs and activities in what is an extraordinarily large uh, US intelligence community. 
Now, Michael, you mentioned that there are over 70 inspector generals throughout the US government. Um, and, and there are some other ones within the intelligence community besides the IC, IG, uh, that the position that you held. Can you talk a little bit about the unique challenges that are presented by intelligence oversight as compared to IGs who are outside of that world? What, what are some of the unique challenges that you saw? So the, the biggest challenge has to do with secrecy, right? So the intelligence community is effective in large part because it operates in secret. And secrecy is important um, because if you, if people know what uh, what the intelligence community knows, then um, it uh, it's not protective of national security uh, for for many different reasons. And so, to operate in secrecy um, is really sort of, uh, in many ways, anti-American, right? Like uh, the founders of our country were not fans of of secrecy. They thought that the citizens should know what is happening in inside the government, and in order for the the, the public to hold the government accountable. But when it comes to the intelligence community, like I said, secrecy is, um, is essential, it's, an, it's necessary. Um, and what's important is to remember that secrecy is not a grant of power, it's a grant of trust. Uh, the, the American citizens are trusting people in the intelligence community to do what's best for the country as a whole and not for any specific individual and certainly not for any adversary of the United States. And so uh, trying to, oversee these huge programs in a secret environment is very challenging, um, but it's also, um, it also gives a, a, an extraordinary responsibility on the people in the intelligence community because our government expects um, people in the intelligence community to speak up themselves if they witness what they believe to be in good faith, you know, wrongdoing, waste, fraud, abuse, uh, any type of illegal behavior. Um, and we have to, encourage that sort of speak up culture within the intelligence community because there are so few Americans who have access to these very, very powerful programs and activities. And when you get into even you know, more secret uh, programs like the, what are called special access programs, the number of Americans who can put eyes or ears on those programs is just, in, in some cases, it's you know, fewer than 50, fewer than 20 people. Mm -hmm. and, and each one of those people has a responsibility, ethical responsibility to speak up if they see wrongdoing. And so one of the challenges for independent oversight in the intelligence community is to encourage people to speak up and to speak up in an authorized way so that if they see a problem, they say something about it and they say something about it in a responsible way so that the sources and methods that are um, you know, critical to protecting our national security are not exposed. And that's what the IGs do. They, they provide an outlet for um, people to, to speak up and allege wrongdoing. And that's why whistleblowers are so important in the intelligence community because they likewise are some of the few Americans who are in a position to raise their hand, you know, raise an alert in, a, in an authorized way when they see alleged wrongdoing. Uh, before we get into the 2019 events with the whistleblower, I wanna pick up on um, this conversation here, and these some of these points that you just brought out about secrecy and the uniqueness of the IC, IG role um, operating within that environment. Um, trying to figure out and drill down on what a whistleblower is. During my career at DOJ in the National Security Division in the Counterintelligence and Export Control section, I spent time managing investigations and prosecutions where people had disclosed classified information without having the authority to do so. So those are sometimes called leaks cases. What is the difference between a leaker and a whistleblower uh, in your mind and having served as ICIG? Are there differences? And, and if so, you know, what are they? There are clear differences, and these, this is a charged topic, um, the leakers and whistleblowers, and so I'm not going to try to cast any judgment, although I will say that, like you, when I was at the Department of Justice and Security Division, I also had responsibility for tracking all of the unauthorized disclosure cases or leaks cases, and I you know, have firsthand experience, in, first of all, in how difficult those cases are to prosecute, but also how important they are uh, to prosecute in order to encourage people to stay within the authorized system of reporting wrongdoing. And that's really the difference that the government makes between a leaker and a whistleblower. A whistleblower, I mean, it, normal thinking is somebody who blows a whistle, 
raises attention uh, to a specific alleged problem. In the intelligence community, a whistleblower is someone who does that, but does it in an authorized way so that they, they follow the rule of law, uh, they follow the regulations that are in, but the laws that are in place about the right way to report that wrongdoing. And the right way to report the wrongdoing is uh, there are a number of different outlets. It can be a supervisor, it can be an agency general counsel, it can be an inspector general, uh, it can be Congress, if they, assuming they go through the right process to get the information to Congress. Uh, it can be someone you know, in their agency who's in a position to, to right the alleged wrong. That's what a whistleblower is, someone who sees something, says something, and, and says it in an authorized way. So again, we don't hurt the sources and methods that are so essential to our national security. A leaker is someone who doesn't follow the authorized uh, process. That's not to say they might not have started uh, you know, down the authorized way and tried to get the information to the right people. Uh, and then for whatever reason, um, they, they felt the need to go outside the system and to leak the information uh, uh, oftentimes to the media. Um, and basically, you know, the, the intelligence community, the Department of Justice, who enforces these, these um, disclosure uh, laws, takes the position that those people, you know, have, have taken the law into their own hands and in many cases do great harm to our intelligence sources and methods. And that's why um, there are these laws in place that hold those people accountable who, who do go outside the authorized process and, and leak information uh, that they're not authorized to do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty interesting and important. I mean, the role that you had as ICIG, and you mentioned that, you know, in your remarks here, how important it was to get people to speak up if they saw wrongdoing, um, but to get them to do it through the authorized channels. Um, and then if people feel like the authorized channels aren't working, then they're inclined to go outside those channels if they feel like there's information that has to get disclosed. And so one thing we're hopefully gonna get to towards the end of our discussion today is whether there are still gaps in whistleblower protections that cause people to go to those unauthorized channels instead of avail themselves of the authorized channels. And we can also maybe get to um, today in our discussion how your actions hopefully have tried to cabin that and send, make sure people understand the authorized channels can, can work for them. But let's, you know, why don't we, why don't we dive into sort of the, the crescendo of what we want to talk to, about today, which is this July, August, September, 2019 time period. Let's take you back to that time frame. Um, <laughs> Uh, no PTSD here. We don't want to trigger that, but just try to mentally go back to July of 2019, August of 2019, and September of 2019. Just kidding, just kidding about going off video there. <laughs> yeah. I'm still here. Um, I'm still here. Good, good, good. <laughs> um, so what, what happened with the whistleblower complaint? Like walk us through, how did it start? Um, how did it get to you and, and walk us through your role? Right. So I mentioned in the beginning that one important role that Inspector General plays uh, in each agency is um, fielding whistleblower complaints. And that was the case at the Intelligence Community Inspector General as well. Um, in fact, when I started there in May of 2018, there was a huge backlog of whistleblower complaints and the office was just not running uh, very effectively or very efficiently, particularly when it came to uh, handling whistleblower complaints. And so one of my first priorities as the Inspector General was to uh, was to get that whistleblowing program in shape. And so I stood up um, what we named the Center for Protected Disclosures. And that center could take in complaints um, from anybody in the world uh, for, for unclassified information. And then for classified information, it could take it from anyone with inside, the inside the United States government who uh, wanted to report uh, wrongdoing involving classified information. And so our whistleblowing program could take in whistleblowing complaints um, through emails, uh, through faxes. We would do in-person interviews as well, meetings. And we had the what's called the high side, the classified side, where classified uh, whistleblower complaints would come in and low side or unclassified uh, whistleblower complaints would come in. The Ukraine whistleblower complaint came in um, on the high side. It, at the time, it involved classified information. Um, and so it came in through an email, through a classified email that was sent to our hotline. And so that came in in August of 2019. So uh, what's that? Mm, 
16 months, 17 months after I'd started. Now, not all of the kinks in the Center for Protective Disclosure had been worked out by the office um, by August of 2019. So when that whistleblower complaint came in, I had been um, tipped off by the general counsel of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Jason Kleitenik, who told me um, uh, a, a day or two before I got word of the whistleblower complaint that my office was going, either had gotten a whistleblower complaint or was going to be getting a whistleblower complaint. Um, and Jason didn't know at the time the identity of the whistleblower. He didn't know the nature of the complaint. He, all he knew was it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a weird complaint. It had gotten the attention of some very high people and that I should you know, keep my eye out for it because it either had been filed or was going to be filed very shortly. And so I went back to my to the whistleblower office and I said, listen, have we gotten any unusual whistleblower complaints? And I was assured, no, no. And next day, have we gotten any whistleblower? No, nothing. And then so two days later, um, in meeting with the attorneys in my office, they said, you know, at the end of a meeting, of a normal meeting, they said, oh, by the way, we, we got a whistleblower complaint. Um, and it was filed under what's called the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. So it was a, it's a special uh, whistleblower complaint, and I'll explain why. Um, and I said, well, has anybody read it? And the answer was no. Uh, so I said, well, I need to see it. And so they said, sure, sure, we'll get you a copy. And so the head of the hotline, you know, a few minutes later, walked down, handed me this, this, this email that had been printed out. And she said, yeah, it came in two days ago. We we're talking to the whistleblower. Um, I said, well, what's the complaint? And she said, well, I haven't read it. Um, so I said, okay, well, so I ended up, so I close my door to the, my office. I sit down at the table and I'm the first person in the world to read the whistleblower's complaint. And um, I mean, we, I assume most people, if not everyone has seen it by now. And within the first six sentences, uh, it says that the whistleblower has information that, you know, President, then President Donald Trump is soliciting foreign interference um, with the assistance of Rudy Giuliani. And oh, by the way, Attorney General William Barr uh, may also be involved. And so those are the first six sentences. And um, I just remember sitting at the desk reading that and thinking, uh, I, you know, it's nine pages. I was, on, I was on the first page and I just felt like this was going to be really uh, career altering for many different people. Um, and putting things into, is reading, turning over the page reading the, the breadth of the complaint, right? It goes back months. It, uh, it's incredibly well-sourced. It has uh, events happening in, in uh, Ukraine, in Madrid, in New York City, uh, in Washington, D.C. It talks about numerous White House officials uh, having information. It talks about this phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine. It talks about uh, records of the phone call being put into a, a super secure system. So there's, there's, there's whiffs of cover up in it. And um, so I remember turning over the last page and just sitting there and the whole time I was reading it, I was, you know, one thing was going through my mind, uh, which was, who can I give this to? Like, <laughs> like any responsible government servant, I was trying to figure out who else can take this complaint because I really don't want it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want, you know, I, we should give it to the FBI. Well, we can't give it to the FBI because the attorney general is allegedly involved and the FBI director reports to the attorney general. So normally we would refer to the FBI. We, we couldn't do that. Uh, can we give it to another inspector general? No, the, for whatever reason, the whistleblower had, had sent it to, our, to the intelligence community inspector general. So, so it fell uh, to, uh, to the office to, to administer that complaint. And, and that's what we set about doing. I mentioned that this was a special whistleblower statute. Um, and the reason the two day delay was so important uh, was because you only have 14 calendar days to um, evaluate a complaint that's filed under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. So, you know, two days of the 14 days were gone. And, you know, welcome to government lawyering. So that's, you know, that just <laughs> sort of happens. And so you just adjust. And so I put together a very small team of, um, an investigator who uh, uh, thankfully was on detail to the office from the FBI, um, our acting general counsel and my deputy who um, 
was on detail from the Department of Justice and also uh, you know, a, a prosecutor as well. So we had three attorneys and an FBI agent who were the core of our team. Uh, and our job was to determine whether the complaint was urgent and credible as defined by the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. And by the way, that act does not define either word, uh, urgent or credible. So um, it was really, uh, and, and we started to parse the statute, uh, we really started to see how vague some of the terms were and how difficult it was going to be to, um, you know, also try to figure out how do you, what's the plan? What's the investigative plan? Because we can't, we have 12 days and we can't go to Madrid. We can't go to in New York City. We also have to protect our sources and methods. And so what we basically, you know, decided to do, what I decided to do was to focus on the call, the president's call and figure out if we could corroborate the substance of the president's call. Because I felt like if we could corroborate the substance of the call, then we would, you know, probably be in a place where we could reasonably determine that this was an urgent concern. So Michael, a couple things jump out at me from that um, description that you give. First of all, the, the complaint itself. So you said it came in on, on the high side, which those of us who've worked um, in uh, national security know that means the highly classified electronic system. Um, how unusual was it to get them on the high side? If, uh, as the ICIG, I imagine a number of complaints come in on the high side. What's the percentage yes, uh, that usually come in? On yeah, that? I don't know. Um, I would say that the percentage of uh, credible whistleblower complaints is quite high um, on the high side. Uh, you know, on the, on the unclassified side, like I said, you can get them from anywhere, anyone in the world and you would get a number of those uh, them that weren't, you know, very uh, credible. Um, it's now, now many were, many were legitimate that came in through the, the classified system, uh, the unclassified system rather. So don't, don't mishear me. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very valuable um, tool to have reports come in on the unclassified side. But I will say that in terms of those that tended to be, you know, um, you know really uh, impactful and important, they tended to, to come through the high side. And so and, I think, yeah. And so I think probably numerically most come through unclassified, but in terms of those that are, you know, in terms of quality of uh, complaint, um, you know, the the high side was really quite effective at uh, at that. Particularly by by August of 2019, I, I felt like we'd gotten the office turned around. We were doing outreach. We were the the number of complaints that we were getting was was you know, coming up, like I thought you had talked about how important it is to instill confidence in the system. And I, I felt like we were doing that. I felt like, you know, the numbers were increasing, which I, you know, now it could be that there's the, the, the wrongdoing was increasing, but I also felt that there was, you know, some, we had gotten the word out and we were becoming a trusted source for whistleblowers. Um, and, and so uh, on the high side, this one, I know obviously in terms of subject matter, it was immediately like different than the others, but what about in terms of like actual substance, like length and sourcing, was it similar to the kinds that you would normally get in on the high side or was it, was, did it already jump out at you as different in addition to being different for the import of the subject matter? Yeah, this was, um, this was unlike anything I'd ever seen. I mean, I have seen whistleblower complaints um, as a prosecutor, right? They're, they're tremendous sources of information for invest for criminal investigations. And this complaint was unlike anything I'd ever seen in terms of the uh, how well written it was, how well sourced it was, um, and, uh, um, and how balanced it was. Because, you know, at the time, the whistleblower wasn't, confident that there was a connection between the withholding of military assistance from Ukraine and either a meeting with the president or, you know, assistance on these politicized investigations. And it turned out, you know, the evidence turned out to be later on that there was, you know, a very strong connection made uh, between the, the withholding of the security clearance and uh, the politicized investigations or the, the meeting with the president. But I, I felt it was, you know, uh, that struck me even in the moment that the, the whistleblower was being very, you know, particular about what he or she was confident in and what they, they didn't have um, a high degree of confidence, which is, as you know, Katie, that's a, that's a sign of a really good intelligence officer. And so that, 
sort of um, gave me, you know, um, added, you know, confidence or comfort in the source because it wasn't somebody who was, you know, making, you know, giant leaps. They were quite logical and, and like I said, very well supported with the evidence that they had. Yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned that you uh, were like thinking, who can I, who else can I give this to, right? <laughs> because you see the import of it and you think, well, there might be uh, evidence of a crime here. There might be something that really needs to be investigated by the federal government. Like who else should do this, you know? And you realize it's you, right? You, you have to handle it. Um, I'm kind of curious with your background as a prosecutor, uh, how, did, how much did you rely on that to kind of determine steps to take? Uh, a lot, <laughs> a lot. I, I um, you know, it was, it, it was very, uh, uh, this is not gonna, this is gonna sound odd, but I was very comfortable about, once I realized, you know, this is our problem, we're gonna have to handle it. I was very comfortable with the process because I had handled, you know, very complex and in, in pretty some fairly politically charged investigations as well in terms of prosecuting, you know, members of Congress. Um, and so I was, I was comfortable with um, what had to be done. And I knew we, I, I wasn't entirely comfortable with the 12 days, don't get me wrong, like that was <laughs> unusual because many, you know, most white collar investigations take, take months, they don't take days. Um, but once we figured out a plan, which was let's focus on the call. And I, and I could be criticized for just for that decision because it turned out um, in hindsight, it turned out to have consequences, which I did not foresee. But at the time I knew we had limited resources, we had limited staff and we had limited time. And so I felt like if we could corroborate the call, you know, we go a long way. And what was helpful was that the whistleblower had said there were multiple people who had either heard the call when it happened or had read um, the, a transcript or you know, notes of the call uh, after the call. And I felt like if we, and the whistleblower wasn't one of those people, right? The whistleblower um, had, not, had not listened to the call live and had not seen, uh, I'm gonna use the word transcript, it's not a transcript, but let's just, it's, it, 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 the notes of the call. But he or she did say that, that others had. And so I felt like if we could find someone who had uh, listened to the call or to my mind, even better, had seen the notes of the call, had seen the transcript of the call, that that would help to corroborate. And remember, all I'm doing is make a decision about whether this is a credible complaint. I'm not deciding that a crime has been committed. Uh, it's just, is this a credible, urgent concern? And so um, we were able to identify um, people who heard the call and people who had seen the call records. And we were able to speak to um, I'm just going to say a number of people, um, including a number of people who had seen the transcript. And so to me, as a former prosecutor and someone who had done, you know, Title III wiretaps, you know, the, the value of a written transcript or notes of a call is just so important because what's said in the moment can be forgotten, it can be misremembered, uh, but a transcript is it's different. It's, it's just, it's a piece of evidence that as long as it exists, it's, it's a fairly um, objective, you know, uh, uh, document, objective story of what happened. And we were able to find a number of people who had seen and read the transcript. And what, uh -huh. uh, what these people told us was consistent with what the whistleblower had alleged. And what these people told us um, was that in their mind, as well as the whistleblower, this was an urgent national security concern and one that you know, needed to be addressed. Right. Okay. So, so as a lawyer, as the ICIG, you look at the statute that's at play, the Intelligence Community, Community Whistleblower Protection Act. You know, you your role is to determine whether it's credible, whether it's urgent. You decide. Okay, I only have twelve days. What should I focus on? I'm going to focus on if the if the call can be corroborated, then that gets me many steps closer to credibility. Um, and then also you're getting your way to urgent too. Uh, so so you, you said you put together a team. Um, backing up before we get to these key events of what happens you know, next, did you, I can't remember, did you say you brought people in or were they people who were already on your team as the ICIG? How, how, how big of a team did you have? 
So there are four of us. Um, the, the core team was four of us, and they were already um, either on detail or employees in the office. So nobody was brought from the outside. And you know, I made the decision to have it such a small team because, as I said, I could see that this was going to be, you know, career altering. And I didn't. <laughs> I I figured I was going to wreck my own career one way or another. Uh, I you know, but. Um, because it was just, it was just so politicized. There was, it was just, it was just so politicized. And so I, I didn't really want to bring any more people than were necessary into the process because I, I didn't want anyone else to, you know, potentially, you know, um, lose their job, um, because of their involvement in this, what I could already see was going to be just a highly politicized, no matter how objective the investigation, the topic was so politicized uh, with President Trump. And, you know, even when I was turning over those pages at my desk, I could, I, I knew the chronology. I mean, I knew that the, the president had gotten on the phone with, the, with President Zelensky of Ukraine the day after Robert Mueller had testified about the Russia investigation. And so, you know, I could see even then that we were, the country was about to go, you know, from the Russia investigation to the Ukraine investigation. And I just, I mean, we'd all lived through the Russia investigation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I could see was we're going to, we're going to live through, you know, what could be something even more politicized, which is going to be this Ukraine investigation. And okay. so, so there was the four of us. Um, and the, like I said, the investigator went out um, with our general counsel, conducted the interviews, um, was really the hands-on, those were the two hands-on people with the whistleblower as well to develop, you know, trust and rapport with the whistleblower because that was important because, you know, we, it, what became very important, um, what was very important at the time and became even more important was protecting the, the identity and protecting uh, the safety of the whistleblower. Right, and I imagine the planning for those interviews must have been pretty uh, intense and difficult too because of what to reveal and, I mean, how to, I just how to structure the interview too, uh, very sensitive information, right? So there had yeah. to be probably detailed planning for, for the interviews among your team. There was, I, I think the, you know, one of the most strategic decisions was who do you approach first? Who do you approach that you think um, has, you know, firsthand information and who will protect thus the sensitivity and the confidentiality of the investigation right. um, and who would also protect you know uh, and who would also be willing to speak right because this person whoever corroborates the whistleblower is going to be putting their own career at risk and the people who heard the call or read the transcript were primarily in the white house and mm -hmm. many of them were on the national security council staff and as you know katie you know, it takes a lot of hard work, um, you know, to get on the national security staff. It's, it's uh, the national security council staff. It's a, it, and so for somebody willing to potentially put their career at risk, put their job at risk, having, you know, worked so hard to get into that position, you know, that's, that was another sort of difficult moment. Like if we're going to have to bring somebody into this to, in order to corroborate it, they're going to have, you know, personal professional consequences, um, and we, mm -hmm. we did identify people who we thought, you know, would have first inf information and would respect the confidentiality uh, of the process and be courageous enough to speak up. And unfortunately, you know, we, we found the right people. Right. So, so uh, you mentioned Robert Mueller had testified July 24th, 2019. This call between then President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine took place on July 25th. 2019. So, so the next day, the complaint lands on your desk. I think it was at August 15th is the day it lands on your desk. And, yes. and so it had come in two days earlier. So you've already lost two days. Uh, and um, you have to determine if it's, if it's credible and if it's an urgent concern and under the timeline specified in the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. So you have you know, 14 days now, 12 days to make that determination. You come up with a plan and the team to do it. You, you execute on that. Um, you conduct your investigation. And uh, on August 26th, I think it was, you determined it was credible and involved an urgent concern. Is, is that right? That 
That's the timeline, yes. Okay, and so then under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, now that you've fulfilled that responsibility as ICIG, I think it says that you have to bring it to the head of the establishment. It goes to the, the Directorate of National Intelligence. It goes to that person. Now, Dan Coates had been the Director of National Intelligence. I believe his last day was August 15th, which is the day it landed on your desk. So there was an acting Director of National Intelligence, and that was Joseph McGuire. Uh, so now tell us what happens on at this point on August 26, when you've determined that it is credible and an urgent concern, what happens? Okay, um, so let me just go back a couple of days because you know I knew that Joe McGuire was the, of course I knew he was the acting DNI, and I knew that he had been in the job for you know about a week, um, and and so I also knew that he would have seven days from whenever I transmitted my determination to, um, to transmit that determination and the whistleblower complaint to the intelligence committees. So I didn't want to wait until the last minute to give, you know, uh, Admiral McGuire, DNI McGuire, acting DNI McGuire, the whistleblower complaint. So I arranged for a meeting with his general counsel, again, Jason Klytenik, um, a couple days before August 26th. I think uh, it was August 26th for the Monday. So I met with Jason the Thursday before and then schedule the meeting with the acting DNI for, for the next day, Friday. Um, and so I wanted to give the general counsel of ODNI a heads up about the whistleblower complaint because what I wanted also was sort of a, you know, check my math type of exercise. I'm not asking you, Jason Klytanek, to tell me we got it right. I'm just saying, you know, we can all look at the statute. We're, we're all lawyers. You're very smart. You have, you know, you've got a deputy who's a long time um, you know, intelligence community professional uh, lawyer as well. You know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the, the facts and I'm going to yeah. tell you my legal analysis. And I just want you to, to check it and just see if you, you know, if we're missing anything. And so, so, I said, so Michael, let me just yeah. interrupt you one yeah, second. Sure. So, so yeah, you had 14 days and then you had 12 days really. And now really you're, it's shorter even because you want to make sure as you know, you rightfully should make sure you're kind of giving a heads up to this person who's going to have seven days. So we're even getting less than the 12 days now where you're, you've started your investigation. You're realizing as the investigation's moving, uh, it's looking credible. It's looking urgent. And I guess as every day closer to the 12 gets there, you're increasingly certain that it is going to be credible and urgent. So before you even get to the 12 days now, you're giving the heads up, hey, this is coming, right? Yes, and so we meet with Jason Lieutenant and his and his top de deputy. So I'm there with with my deputy as well, and we're in the headquarters of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. And the four of us are in our conference room, uh, in Jason's conference room, and I tell him orally the whistleblower what the the, the essence of the whistleblower complaint. I'm, I'm I'm not giving him a copy, um, and he, by the way, at this point has he knows the identity of the whistleblower not from me, but from another source. So uh, he and his deputy both know the identity of the whistleblower, although they agreed uh, and they, they kept their word uh, not to tell anybody else within ODI and i about uh, the whistleblower's identity. So the four of us are there in the room and I walk them through the whistleblower complaint, the facts and our you know, legal analysis. And Jason, and, you know, and, and we all know how stark the whistleblower allegations are and so I, said, Jason, you know, what do you think? And he looked at me and he said, I think I just threw up in my mouth. Like that's just how, <laughs> sorry, for, sorry for people who are eating lunch right now, but that was just sort of uh, how we all sort of understood how serious um, and potentially ugly the situation was gonna be. Um, but Jason, you know, was a professional and, and his deputy as well. And so they, they gave us their, their thoughts on, on, the, on the legal analysis. The next day we met with the acting director of national intelligence and Watch. At that point, I, I shared a copy of the whistleblower complaint um, with the acting DNI and watched him through our legal analysis. Um, I didn't share the identity of the whistleblower because I wasn't permitted. And um, the DNI, you know, he got it immediately. And you know, I remember him saying, you know, this just has the makings of a, of, I, I believe he said, of a constitutional crisis. And so at that point, there's, you know, a handful of people in the country who know what is what is coming. And Joe McGuire is one of them. Um, but he also said, 
you know, in that conference room on that Friday before I sent him the complaint, he, he just said, listen, we just have to do our jobs. And, uh, and he stuck to that. He, he let me do my job. Um, so I, on that Monday, I hand delivered the whistleblower complaint to the director of national intelligence through Jason. And they were supposed to, uh, you know, make comments on it if they wanted and then transmit it to the intelligence committees within seven days. Well, as we know, seven days came and went. They didn't transmit it to the intelligence committees and, and I knew why they weren't doing that. Yeah, um, I just wanna note, we are getting a lot of really good questions in the chat and we are gonna get to them. Um, uh, so don't worry, we're gonna get to these questions in the chat and the Q and A. But I do wanna take Michael through the rest of the events here before, before we turn to that. Um, so, so you meant you turn it over to acting DNI McGuire. Um, he had had a heads up; it was coming. You guys are working, you know, uh, not together, but you're communicating well about what the what the status is. And um, you mentioned that under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, he would have uh, he would have seven days. And I'm just going to read the language from from the statute. Upon receipt of a transmittal from the Inspector General under subparagraph B, the director shall, within seven calendar days of such receipt, forward such transmittal to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. Um, and so you think, okay, he has to turn this over to the Congressional Intelligence Committee. That, that's what the statute says, shall. What happened? He didn't. <laughs> yeah. and, and you mentioned that you knew a little bit of why. Tell us briefly why he did. Okay, I will. And so let me just go back one, uh, just unwind a little bit because I forgot to mention one thing. The other reason I, I, I told Joe McGuire what I was doing, I gave him a heads up, was because I, I also planned to investigate the complaint um, as an office. I intended to, uh, you know, once I made my determination, we were gonna, um, we were gonna get the FBI involved, and we did. We got the FBI involved. The, the 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 day after I transmitted it to the hand delivered it to the director of national intelligence, I contacted you know the FBI director personally to to refer the matter to the FBI. But I also told the DNI what I intended to do in terms of opening an investigation through my office, referring the matter to the FBI, um, because the director of national intelligence can stop me from can stop the inspector general from investing a, investigating a matter uh, in the interest of national security. And so I wanted to give Joe McGuire a heads up that yes, I was going to investigate this. And I reminded him, because again, he's only been in the job for a week, that he has the, well, I'm sure his general counsel would have reminded him as well, that he had the authority to stop me from investigating um, if there was, if he deemed it in the interest of national security. Now, he would have to disclose to Congress that he had stopped my investigation, but I, I wanted to give him a heads up that I was investigating as well. And so on the same day that I hand delivered my determination to the Director of National Intelligence, I also sent a, a document hold notice uh, to the White House. And so I, I told the White House to hold all the documents related to the Ukraine whistleblower, uh, to, to, to the president's call, I, um, because I intended to investigate. And so, so for, for others yeah. on the webinar, just explain what a document hold notice is. So one of the first things you do when your investigation has gone overt, meaning it's it's you know it's not a secret any longer. Is you make sure that the evidence doesn't disappear, and so you put a you write to people who are in possession of relevant evidence um, and ask them to hold the evidence to retain the evidence um, because it's going to be subject to an official investigation. And if documents were intentionally destroyed uh, after such a document hold was put in place, um, that can be you know potential charges for obstruction of justice. So, so anyways, I, I sent the whole notice to the White House. I told the DNI what I was doing. I referred the matter to the FBI, made a formal referral to the FBI uh, through, the direct, through the FBI director. Um, and All then, of this on uh, August 25th-ish, 6th, August 26th, around that. Yeah, right, yeah, either okay. the 26th or the next day, the 27th. Okay. Um, uh -huh. And then, um, so I talked about you know, going to the DNI on the Friday before I sent my transmittal. And at that point, you know, I understood that the White House was going to have to be involved because we were dealing with um, classified information at the time. And we were dealing with, you know, materials that were subject to executive privilege, right? So the president's phone call 
uh, with a with another a foreign leader, you, you start to get into really uh, some of the most sensitive ma matters in the executive branch, and those communications, unless they're waived, um, are subject to executive privilege. And so I understood. And so again, the whole purpose is to get this complaint, this whistleblower complaint to Congress, right? To the intelligence committees. Not because I want to do that, but because that's what the whistleblower wants. The whistleblower wants the complaint to go to Congress. Congress has given the whistleblower this process and all I'm trying to do is implement that process. Through the, um, the I, statutorily prescribed process, right? By yes. statute, it says, right? So yes. yeah. Uh -huh. But you also have to deal with these other issues, which is executive privilege, right? The executive branch, has rights over over you know some of those materials, and so I knew the White House was going to have to be involved in order to help us sort through um, how to you know protect executive privilege and not waive it through these dis disclosure to Congress. Right. Um, but I also knew as soon as I very shortly after I hand delivered my determination to the DNI that the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel had become involved, and um, and I knew. And how did you find that out? Uh, Jason Clayton, the, the general counsel of OD9, informed me that he was um, either he had sought advice or the White, I don't remember exactly, or the White House had gone and gotten the Department of Justice involved. I don't know who invited the Department of Justice um, to, the, to the discussion, um, but it was entirely appropriate for the Office of Legal Counsel you know, to get involved. I had dealt with the Office of Legal Counsel when I was a federal prosecutor. Um, I knew that they were incredibly smart lawyers. Um, you know, one of the reasons the Department of Justice, in my view, is the best law firm in the world is in large part because of the, the quality of the lawyers, especially those in the Office of Legal Counsel. But I was also Thanks. starting to hear that the Office of Legal Counsel had, in my view, made a fairly quick decision, preliminary decision anyways, that the whistleblower complaint did not fall within the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. And so it wasn't uh, so that basically the OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, DOJ, was, was making a lot of um, statements. And I was on, I was on uh, at least one conference call with the Office of Legal Counsel before they made, a, they made their formal opinion in which they were saying, you know, we don't, the president's not a member of the intelligence community. Um, you know, this phone call isn't an intelligence operation. We don't think it falls within uh, the statute. And... Uh, and that was ultimately their decision that the whistleblower complaint did not fall within the act. And that opinion had a couple of really significant consequences. One, since the act didn't apply, the acting director of national intelligence had no obligation to forward the complaint to the intelligence committees. Right. The language that I read wouldn't apply. Uh, so he wouldn't have to forward it. Mm -hmm. Right. And the other significant consequence was if the act doesn't apply, that means the DNI doesn't have jurisdiction over the conduct, right? Which also means I don't have jurisdiction to investigate it. So my investigation is over uh, once the OLC issues its opinion, because I'm bound as a member of the executive branch uh, by the OLC opinion. And I was determined to, uh, you know, above everything else to operate within the rule of law and respect the OLC opinion. So I stopped my investigation as soon as uh, OLC issued its opinion. But the other thing I knew as well was that if the DNI didn't have um, jurisdiction to oversee this, and if I didn't have jurisdiction to investigate it, and nobody else in the intelligence community had you know, jurisdiction to investigate it, um, that the only people left to investigate it were the FBI, which was fine. I, I, had, I have full faith in, you know, uh, in the FBI, having worked with you know, a number of FBI agents, uh, hundreds of FBI agents. So, um, I had I had faith in the FBI, but I also had a whistleblower who wanted to get the complaint to Congress, and I had a whistleblower who was frustrated and was not going to be able to get that complaint to Congress in an authorized way. And so now you've got, you know, you're trying to make the rules work. You've got somebody who's played by the rules, and what you're basically, you know, potentially telling the whistleblower is you need to go outside the, the authorized process. You're gonna to have to become a leaker. And I wasn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't gonna let that happen either if I could stop it. And so I had to figure out a way to alert Congress to the complaint without, you know, violating OLC's opinion, without waiving executive privilege and without disclosing classified information because no one had authorized me to disclose classified information to Congress. 
Right. So, so this right here is like the key moment, right? You've, you've done all this, you know, hard work to review the complaint, figure out if it's credible, figure out if it's urgent. You followed the statute. You think, you know, you provide it to the DNI. You think it's going to get to the Hill. It doesn't, but, and you've tried all these other appropriate avenues too with the FBI and you've notified the White House too and all these things like trying to be the good public servant that you could. But now here you're, you're having this dilemma and this, this is the critical moment, right? Because you've done everything so far that you feel like has to be done and should be done. And yet you feel like there's something missing. It does need to get there. And you're trying to figure out how am I going to get this to the Hill in an authorized way? So, Michael, what did you do? <laughs> do what any good lawyer does. You write a, you write a letter. And so that's what I, I wrote a letter. Um, I wrote a letter to the intelligence committees um, to inform them that there had been a filing under the Intelligence Committee Whistleblower Protection Act. I had deemed it to be urgent and credible, um, but that it was not being forwarded to the committees by the DNI. I didn't- You don't convey the substance. You don't convey the identity of the whistleblower. You just tell them, here, is, here are facts about, I received this thing. I determined it to be this under the statute. And yes, right. And I told the DNI what I was doing the entire time. I, I, I through his general counsel, I told them, you know, during that, you know, the seven days go by, they don't forward to the complaint. Uh, you know, during the next week, I'm talking to them almost daily about trying to encourage them to notify Congress to just the fact of a filing, just notify them that there's been a filing because the DNI has the authority. Like OLC did not say you can't notify Congress. What OLC said was you're not required to notify Congress. So the DNI had the discretion to alert the committees to the fact of a filing. And that's what I was trying to encourage them to do. And I kept telling them, if you don't do it, I'm going to have to do it because by, by law, um, I felt I had a legal obligation to notify Congress to the fact of a filing because, first of all, you know, I, I have an, I had a statutory obligation to alert Congress to any serious deficiency uh, in the operation of laws within the intelligence community. And I thought that, that the failure of a whistleblower to alert the intelligence committees to something related to foreign election interference, like if the law doesn't apply, to foreign election interference for a whistleblower in the intelligence community, that to me is a significant deficiency in the law. And so I needed to alert the committees to this significant deficiency. I also had a legal obligation to um, inform Congress because I, I should have said this in the beginning, IGs have dual reporting responsibilities. They have to keep their boss, in my case, the director of national intelligence, currently and fully informed of what's going on in, in, with, with the job. And I had also a legal obligation to keep the intelligence committees, both the House, um, Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee fully and currently informed of what's going on with the job as well. And I also had a legal obligation to inform those committees if there was something going on in the job that was preventing me from fulfilling a legal obligation. That if the director and I, uh, this, the, the statute says, if, if the DNI and I have a have a dispute that's that's preventing me from fulfilling a legal, legal obligation, I had a, a statutory duty to inform the committees of that fact. And so that was the legal authority I used to send that letter to the intelligence committees. Right, so frustration with the fact that the, the DNI wouldn't send it himself, but you figured out a way that you felt was meeting your responsibilities and what you owed to the whistleblower. And so you notify the Hill of those, the facts without giving them the substance. And, and then what happened? Then um, all hell broke loose, honestly. <laughs> the committees, once the committees understood that there was this whistleblower complaint that had not been forwarded, there was at the time bipartisan interest in trying to understand what the complaint was about. What was the, what was the nature of this alleged urgent concern? Which by the way, if it's an, if it's an urgent concern coming from the intelligence committee, inspector general, it's, it's an urgent concern. It's an urgent national security concern. And so they tried to, encourage the director of national intelligence to, you know, forward the complaint as well. Um, but the, the DNI would not. And, and he um, was also, you know, making public statements or statements to the, to the oversight committees that, you know, this wasn't, it didn't involve the activities of, a, of anyone in the intelligence community, which was true because it involved the president. 
Um, and it didn't involve an intelligence activity as the statute required, which I didn't think was exactly right because I, you know, the DNI is responsible for overseeing um, threats to, you know, uh, from foreign election interference and taking steps to prevent and deter that type of foreign election interference. So with that public narrative coming out that it's not anybody related, it's not naming the intelligence community, but not saying it's the president, it's not in, related to an intelligence activity, but not saying it's foreign election interference. I wrote a second letter uh, to the intelligence committees tell, not disclosing that the, the substance of the complaint or even the nature of the allegation, but I did say in a second letter that the allegations relate to one of the most significant and important responsibilities of the DNI. And that, for whatever reason, seemed to break the, break the dam because within a couple of days, the White House released the whistleblower complaint and the White House also released um, the transcript of the president's phone call. So the second letter that you sent had that effect, that it, it caused the White House to release the complaint and the transcript. I think um, it, was part of, it, was, it was part of a cascading chain of events because there was tremendous public pressure right. uh, on, the, on the DNI uh, and the White House by then to to disclose the, the to, to to release the disclosure and so it was it was part of that chain of events I don't know that it was causative as lawyers yeah. had say, but it was uh, I think it it did have because it had some influence because it was one way of saying this is not nothing this is this is really it really does relate to one of the most significant and important responsibilities of the DNI which and in my view it does mm -hmm. were your letters that you were sending were they public at the time were they becoming public I mean you weren't making them public but were they becoming public. They were becoming public. They were not classified, and they were sent to the to the intelligence committees. And the intelligence committees was either releasing the the letters themselves or the the substance of the letters, which right. okay. Congress is allowed to do, by the way. Right. Right. Okay. So so uh, after the second letter, the whistleblower complaint breaks free and gets to Congress, and the transcript uh, does. And then what happens to you right after that? Is this when you're asked to testify? Yes. So I so after I sent the first letter, I, I was called down to um, to the House Intelligence Committee to talk about um, the first letter and um, also the second letter as well. But it's, at the time, I couldn't I couldn't disclose the nature of the complaint. I couldn't disclose because uh, I it, it involved uh, I had, they, the White House had not waived executive privilege. Nobody had authorized any disclosure of classified information. So I basically went down to the House Intelligence Committee uh, in a closed session and alerted them to, the, you know, told them about there was this filing, explained what my office had done and why we viewed it as urgent. And the analogy I used with the, Intelli the House Intelligence Committee was basically a fire alarm. You know, Congress had provided the whistleblower with an authorized fire alarm. And the whistleblower had pulled the fire alarm. And I had determined that it was a credible alarm. Like there, there might not be an actual fire, but it's a, it's a credible alarm. There's, it's, not a, it's not a crank uh, call. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a fake call. Um, but you know, somebody needs to come and respond to this alarm. I mean, an IG is a first responder. Uh, the FBI is a first responder. And the intelligence committees are first responders. And so that was the analogy I used that um, the whistleblower pulled the alarm. I think it's a credible alarm. And what you don't know is that and the reason I wrote this letter was because the Department of Justice had basically turned the alarm off, disarmed the, the alarm uh, so that nobody could hear it any longer, uh, or at least Congress couldn't hear it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good analogy. And, and uh, so, so you end up testifying in a closed hearing before SISI, right? Senate Select Committee on Intelligence? Both, um, both HIPSI and SISI, I testified in closed sessions. HIPSI and SISI. Okay, so you testify in closed sessions then, and that testimony is still classified, still sealed. Um, what happens to your role after that testimony? Do you, do you kind of drop out and they, they kind of go, you know, I know what happens in the chain of events, but what happens to your role after that testimony? Um, our role it becomes essentially um, working to protect the the whistleblower, like our our source, protect the the identity of the whistleblower, and um, uh, at least as importantly, if not more importantly, protect the safety of the whistleblower. And so that took on a couple of different. Uh, I'll just tell a really quick story. You know, 
we had gotten a call after I had gone and testified in a closed session. The press had become alerted to this, you know, this this national story. And we got a uh, Jason Clytenic, Odie, and I got a call from a reporter saying that they were going to identify the whistleblower. They knew the whistleblower's name, and they were going to publicly identify the whistleblower in a press report. The problem was they had the wrong name. The reporter had the wrong name, and so now there's a conundrum of what do you can you tell the reporter they have the wrong name. Um, and so Jason said, what can we say? And I said, well, give me a couple of minutes and we talk to my team, and I'll get back to you. And you know, it took us only a couple of minutes to realize we couldn't tell the reporter that the reporter had the wrong name um, because then we'd have hundreds of reporters calling until they found the right name. And we wouldn't be able to say, no, that's the wrong name. We wouldn't, we wouldn't want to lie to the media, but we, wouldn't also, we also couldn't confirm it. So we basically had to tell the reporter, you know, we couldn't Walmart, tell them the wrong right. name, right? So we can't confirm or deny that, which I understood. Now we're going to have this person who was in the intelligence community, you know, their name's going to be outed and they're just going to have a horrible day because they're going to have to, we're going to have to get them security. And then they're going to have to, you know, to, to tell the public that they're not the whistleblower in a, tell, in a convincing way. Um, and so before we told the reporter they had the wrong name or they, we couldn't say anything, we did. We, they had to get a security detail for this person who'd been identified. And somebody had to go to this person and say, listen, you're going to be outed as a whistleblower. Uh, and we've got a security detail here for you. And, you know, thankfully, the reporter did not run with that story. Um, so that individual did not have their name blasted across the news. But that just sort of tells you, you know, you can plan for all of these, you know, contingencies. And I just had not thought that we'd have a reporter calling with the wrong name. Right, right, and and how to address that without creating additional problems. So right, but basically, um, our you know basically the 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 investigation was turned over to um, the HIPSI. They ran with the investigation. Sissy also did an investigation, the whistleblower complaint. You know, the FBI it turns out didn't do any investigation. Um, they had uh, you know the Department of Justice determined that they weren't going to investigate the um, the activity. So so HIPSI really took the lead in the investigation, and we had continued to have involvement with the. With the whistleblower, but, but mostly on a logistics and uh, uh, safety side. Right, and so then you know we all kind of know what happened from there. Um, uh, it leads to the ultimate in first impeachment of then President Trump. Um, uh, not too many months after that. Uh, uh, so so okay, I know we want to get to these questions in the chat, but um, before we do, uh, let me ask you kind of one more just sort of overarching question, getting back to what we talked about at, at the beginning and leakers and whistleblowers and, and challenges there and, and whether you think there are, based on your experience, key changes that should be made to whistleblower protection laws um, to fix anything that maybe went awry here. I think that the, so first of all, you know, this, the, the IG statute, the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act, the whistleblower laws were just put to an, an enormous stress test through the Ukraine whistleblower um, matter. And I think that the, the whistleblower laws, I think, worked. I think that they, they, came, they survived the stress test. And um, I think that there could be, you know, work done to, you know, protect the identity of whistleblowers, particularly to require Congress to um, protect the identity of whistleblowers, because we all have an interest, all branches of government have an interest in good government and good government requires, you know, honest public servants willing to come forward and disclose alleged wrongdoing in an authorized way. So I think the whistleblower laws, you know, did, did came, came through pretty well. I think that the, I think what we saw was in terms of inspectors general, who are another critical component to public accountability, you know, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but you know, one of the core um, components of an inspector general, of an effective inspector general, is independence. You know, independence of the both the agency head and independence from Congress, and so that they're objective, they're nonpartisan, um, and they can be trusted by whistleblowers because they are independent and they're they're bringing their own real sense of independence. And I, I felt like, you know, I felt like I got fired basically because I acted, I, I did what I was required to do by statute in terms of acting independently. And I think that if inspectors general can be fired for acting independently, then that's a, that's a significant problem because it will chill 
independence from inspectors general. They think they're going to be fired for doing what the law requires. But it will also chill, in some ways, whistleblowers, because whistleblowers need to trust the process and they need to trust that whatever IG they're going to is going to be independent. It's going to be nonpartisan um, and protect them in an, in an in objective way. And so I think that's really where work needs to be done is if we're going to have independent IGs, and I'm a huge fan of independent IGs, then we need to um, take steps to really protect their independence. Yeah, there are actually a lot of questions in uh, the Q&A um, about the issue of how, how do we encourage people to come forward through the authorized channels. One other question that relates to these questions I'm seeing in the Q&A is, like, how did you publicize the changes that you made um, when you first started? Uh, you mentioned that you started, I'm just looking at my notes, the Center for Protective Disclosures. Like, how do you publicize that within the intelligence community? A couple of different ways. So each, um, each IG is required by statute to put out semi-annual reports. So twice a year, we would do a, a report on our activities. Ours was public. We would do both a, a, a unclassified version and a, a classified version. But the unclassified version would describe the changes that we were making to, the, to our whistleblower program. And we would also do um, uh, events within the intelligence community, public events, um, to talk to employees, talk to contractors about what an IG does, um, about the rights that employees and contractors have, about their ethical responsibilities to come forward with complaints um, of wrongdoing. And then for whenever an intelligence community, whether it's an employee um, or contractor on detail to the, to the, to the uh, ODNI especially, um, whenever their, their first day on duty the, the inspector general's office would go and meet with all of those people on their first day and introduce them to the office and remind them of their ethical obligation to, to come forward and explain to them the authorized way, the ways to report wrongdoing and the steps we were taking uh, within the office to um, encourage whistleblowing and encourage confidence in our whistleblowing program especially. Um, another question I'm just seeing here in, in the Q&A that gets back sort of factually to, to what happened, um, where you were advised, I think you said by Jason Kleitenek that, hey, heads up, you're going to be getting a complaint. How often are you advised that a complaint is coming? Was that unusual? Yeah, that was very unusual. I don't remember ever being advised um, or given a heads up in advance of a whistleblower complaint. I, I understand why. Um, Jason, you know, got that information. I think most of it's been reported now in the, in the press in terms of, you know, the steps, you know, as we all know from the impeachment hearings, the president's phone call just with President Zelensky attracted a lot of attention within the White House and raised a lot of alarms within the White House, alarms that went to the, you know, the legal advisor to the National Security Council, especially. And, um, and so there was a lot of, a, a fair number of complaints about that call that were bubbling up and the whistleblowers was, was one of them. Uh, but no, highly unusual to be, you know, tipped off by anybody in, in the agency general counsel's office to the fact of a whistleblower complaint. But there's nothing, in, there's nothing improper about that. I, um, because I, I think that the people who were giving Jason a heads up, you know, I think they just wanted, I, 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 I think there was a sort of a, like let's make sure that if if this is if this is coming to the inspector general that he knows about it because whoever tipped off Jason knew the the nature of the complaint they knew how sensitive it was and how you know serious it would be and so I don't I don't read any wrongdoing or bad faith into that I, I think it was people just you know it was just an incredibly it was just an extraordinary situation and we were all trying to deal with something that no one had really ever dealt with before right right. Um... Uh, okay, here's another question from the Q&A. This is less factual and more big picture existential. How can we create a culture that encourages integrity, trust, and ethical behavior when there seems to be a crisis of confidence, confidentiality, and high office and world leadership? Whistleblowers may feel marginalized and unprotected because of loopholes in the law. Breaking the silence and wrongdoing seems dangerous in this era. That Any is a great. On that? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question, and um, um, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me let me say um, two things. One, I think that any whistleblower program 
in order to be effective and credible uh, has to start with uh, the tone at the top. Like the, 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 the leaders of the organization have to um, encourage whistleblowing and they have to um, instill trust in the process, but they have to, this is my second point. They have to do it not just in word, that tone at the top, not just has to be in word, which is very important, but it also has to be in deed, right? It has to be through action, through conduct. And, and so that's what integrity is. And integrity is not, it means more than just being honest. It remains, it means being consistent in word and deed. And, and that's what is critical for any whistleblower, pro, whistleblower program is that there's the right tone at the top and that there's integrity in, in the system in the sense that you do what you say you're going to do. And so that was, that was, you know, that was one of the biggest disappointments um, with the decision not to forward the whistleblower complaint because you know, you can all, you can all say, you know, uh, in quiet times, whistleblowing is really important. You should, we 100% support our whistleblowers. But, you know, it's the extraordinary situations where the, the conduct, you know, matters more than ever. And I, I just, I felt, I, I really feel like it was a missed opportunity for the intelligence community, especially to show that type of, you know, to, to operationalize integrity and to, to take an extraordinary situation. And we all knew, we all knew how politicized this was going to be. We all knew how the President Trump's negative views of the intelligence community. Um, we all knew how, you know, if this whistleblower complaint became public, how, how, how opposed, vehemently opposed, the president was likely to be. And I just, I just feel like it was a missed opportunity. And I, I think that, you know, it, it was just, it was just, you know. You can't take whistleblowing as a transaction, right? It's not a transaction. You can't, you can't try to, um, it's not transactional. It's, it's, a, it's a trust system. And so you just have to, you know, you have to follow the rules no matter uh, how extraordinary the allegation. Um, now, so Michael, the you know, story didn't end with the impeachment of President Trump because then what happened in, in April of 2020 uh, was that you were fired. Um, by, by then President Trump. How did you find out that you were fired by him? So that was a, uh, I was, I got a phone call. Uh, that was a Friday night um, around 930. And I got a phone call from the, the Office of Director of National Intelligence's Chief Operating Officer. And she called me um, around 930 at night. And I'm, I'm on the phone with her in the other room. And she's telling me, and she's very upset, you know, I have to tell you, you've been fired. And then in the other room in, in, in our house, I hear my, 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 my sons who are home for the summer, uh, you know, yelling out loud, hey, dad, you've been fired. <laughs> you know, you've been fired. Because uh, they're seeing it on cable television come across the track, you know, the track at the same time. I'm, he I'm hearing it directly from the chief operating officer. But that's... Were you, were you that's surprised? Hard. Uh, no, 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 I was not surprised. I, um, I, like I said, when I first read the complaint, when I, after I turned over the ninth page of the whistleblower complaint, I figured that um, it was going to be career altering. I knew when I um, delivered that, hand delivered that, my determination to Jason Clytanic, I said to him that that evening of um, August 26th, before I left his office, I said, you know, do you want to yell out a warning to anybody still in the office? Because it was late at night on, a, on Monday evening. And, and he said, well, what warning do you want me to yell out? And I said, dead man walking. Because I, I figured that I was going to be fired. It was just a matter of time. Once the Vinman brothers were removed from the White House, um, I knew uh, for, with almost you know, virtual certainty that I would be fired. And, and after the Vinmans were walked out, you know, I, I cleaned out my own office of all personal items because I, I, I knew it was just a matter of time. Um, so uh, the, a couple questions in the Q&A related to this um, uh, issue, and one is, should, should Congress take steps to further insulate inspector generals from politically motivated terminations? Do, do you think they should, and can they? I, I think that they, so I'm, I'm going to say yes to that, and I'm going to, but, but it's a complicated yes, and it's a complicated process because what you're dealing with is, is, is separation of powers, right? And you've, you've got the executive branch and the, the executive who's the commander in chief and he has to have, he or she has to have the, the right to remove people quickly, uh, political appointees um, 
you know, with or without cause. What's complicated is that you have these inspectors general who are political appointees, but who by law are required to be independent. And like I said, you can't, you, you, you really shouldn't be fired for being independent, it shouldn't be caused. And so I do think Congress should really look seriously at ways to, um, you know, uh, make sure that an IGs, you know, can't be fired for being independent. Maybe that requires um, a term limit for IGs in order to, you know, satisfy the really important constitutional separation of powers concerns. Um, but it just, you know, we just can't have a system where you expect a person to be independent, but they can be fired for being independent. That's not, um, it, it's not sustainable. Uh, do you think that um, uh, the, I guess anything related in this incident with the whistleblower or in your firing caused lasting damage to the IG community? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Uh, do you think that the Ukraine whistleblower incident in general or your firing, this is a question from the Q&A, um, or from the Trump administration caused lasting damage to the IG community? Lasting damage. Um, I think the IG community is, is, has been um, quite resilient. I, I think that, I don't know, I think my answer might be different if, if there was a different administration um, in charge and, and it, you know, we, it, 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 you know, it might be different if a, a different administration comes, you know, back in charge. But I think the IG community uh, quite resilient. I think that the the current administration, you know, they 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 put out a um, a notice that the Biden administration put out a notice to agencies, um, encouraging agencies to cooperate with their inspectors general. And so I think that was that was important. I think that the Biden administration, you know probably could go, uh, you know, one step further and, and um, you know, issue an executive order that sets out the, the causes for IG removal that the Biden administration will use. I mean, it won't be, have the force of legislation, but it would, it would set the right tone and, and it, would, it would, you know, send a signal not only to IGs, but to whistleblowers as well that the, the Biden administration, you know, expects IGs to be independent and they will not be removed uh, for exercising that, that, that independence. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we're coming close to the end here, but let me see if I can get in one or two more questions. Uh, you faced, right, a very public, very significant challenge of how to uphold the rule of law and navigate your way through what was really an intense ethical dilemma. Now, not all lawyers will face it so publicly and at such a high politically charged level, but really all lawyers face some version of an ethical dilemma how should we as professors prepare law students or how should you know, students prepare themselves for the challenge of upholding the rule of law and handling ethical dilemmas in their practice? Well, another, another really good question. Um, let me, so the, the, the rule, so we, as John Adams so famously said, you know, we are um, a government of laws, not of men, but in order to um, uphold or enforce those laws, it requires people, right? You have to have people um, willing to uphold the rule of law. And, and that does require people who are ethical. And I think as lawyers, first of all, it's, it's very, 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 very important for lawyers, particularly young lawyers, to understand the ethical rules, to learn them and to follow them scrupulously. Um, but it's also important for lawyers of all experience levels to understand that, you know, oftentimes, like the world's complex. Um, and so, you know, the solutions for complex problems can be complex. And sometimes you have to be, they have to be creative. Um, um, and so it's important in those really complex situations to look at ethics, um, not as a, not as a not as a destination, but as a process, right? Ethics oftentimes is a it's a process to get to the to what is the you know the best answer, uh, the most ethical uh, answer, what's best for the and if, as a government lawyer, you know what's ultimately in the best interest of the United States. Like that's a that's a phrase that as a prosecutor, um, that as an inspector general, you know you that's the phrase you want to talk about is what's in the best interest of the United States. And um, in terms of those 
those complex situations, the, the last piece of advice I'll give is have an open mind, right? Have an open mind and foster uh, an open-minded culture. This is why, you know, dissent has values, right? Dissent has values, value. Um, whistleblowers have value even when they're wrong. You know, dissent has value um, because it improves the quality of our decision-making process, which hopefully will improve the quality of our decisions. And so uh, I think it's really important um, to have an open mind. I think it's really important if you're interviewing with corporations, you're interviewing with law firms, um, or you become a manager or leader yourself to, to look for open-minded leaders and to be an open-minded leader, because that's how you're gonna make, um, it, it, it just, it just it, it's how you can make some of the best decisions because you're gonna have some of the best, you're gonna have the best decision-making process when you open your process to all voices, uh, especially those who um, are dissenting. I, you know, I really like that. And I'm going to, I wrote it down. Ethics is a process, not a destination. I mean, that's really, those are really good words for any lawyer to, to follow and live by. And, you know, I've kind of, I think I've seen that idea and it felt, I've done that in my practice, but I've never heard it expressed in a way that I really feel like captures it so, so eloquently. So, so thank well, you just, for that. Yeah. Just in terms of ethics, I probably stole that from somebody, but uh <laughs> But uh, I like it as well. So whoever right. thought it originally, um, kudos to them. Great, great. I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Dean Skank right now. But thank you so, so much, Michael, for this conversation. Thank you, Katie. I really enjoyed it. You're on mute, Dean Skank. Sorry about that. Um, I'm the Associate Dean for National Security, Cybersecurity, and Foreign Relations Law. And I wanted to thank Assistant Dean Tiltman from the Government Procurement Law uh, program and in assisting with setting this up. I, I do want to thank you for the two messages that I, I, I uh, take away from this, um, and that is service to the, the nation and uh, the, to remember that your client is the government and uh, the nation and doing what's best for the country is the most important thing to remember when you're serving in the government. The second thing um, I want to say is, you know, something I learned from being in the JICO for 25 years, and that is, in the end, all you have is your integrity. I mean, that is it. So you have to go with your moral compass, and you've got to rely on integrity. So I think if you keep those two things in mind when you're performing these roles in the government, I think you'll do well in the end. And uh, so I do want to thank both of you for this was just riveting. And I think the fact that you brought the sense of urgency that sometimes happens in the government work, you know, it's like you're, you're on fire, um, but you've got to maintain what's doing what's right and the thought process. I mean, to me, the fact that you had to engage in these efforts in a matter of you know, hours essentially and, and every day it was just ticking away. And I think it's just uh, important for those students we have in the audience to know that when you're going in the government, it, it's not just, you know, government work. It is this engaging with urgent issues every day, every day. It's some urgent issue you have to deal with. So thank you both for coming and bringing this, your experience to the table and your stories. Um, I wanna remind the audience if they didn't hear it in the beginning that you both are professorial lecturers in law for GW Law School and Professor Keatian is currently teaching a course on disinformation. She teaches in the spring. She also teaches counterintelligence in the fall. So, so we've had her in the curriculum for quite some time. We also have Michael Atkinson, who's joining our uh, adjunct faculty, and he'll be teaching artificial intelligence in the fall, uh, two credits in the evening. Um, and so we hope that you can be part of the, uh, the GW Law programs if you're, if you're thinking about that. Also, Assistant Dean Tiltman and I are on the website if you have any questions or issues. And we have these great events that you can uh, participate in as well. So thanks to everyone, I appreciate it. I would give you a tchotchke if you were here. <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you. All right, take care. Thank you.